Hey there, we're Joel and Michelle of The Wandering Hearts, and we're helping you live a more abundant life by traveling abroad. So we're on a mission to help digital nomads, early retirees, or others, perhaps even yourselves, to incorporate full-time travel or even slow travel seamlessly into your work or retirement life for a more abundant lifestyle. So now this episode is part of our Nomadic Abundance podcast. Uh, you can find that both on YouTube as well as soon you'll find it on quite a few of the other different podcast distribution networks. Uh, so you can definitely check out our playlist for more on that. Um, now, over the years, we've gotten quite a few questions on just through our travels, both on our website or even on our YouTube channel and the comments there. And they're always, so we thought we'd just kind of sit down and go ahead and answer those questions for everybody. Um, but there are so many questions and they're about all kinds of different topics that we decided to kind of break it down into maybe a couple of different episodes where we discuss uh, different things like specific countries, uh, that sort of thing. So today we're actually going to talk about full-time travel. And so we'll answer all the questions that we've, or a, a selection of the questions that we've gotten about full-time travel. Yeah, so we're gonna break it down into lifestyle, accommodations, budgeting, food, communications, and healthcare. And so these questions are, a lot of them are the ones that get repeated probably the most that we're trying to answer for you guys. So let's get into it and we're gonna start with lifestyle. So the first question is, do you ever find yourself getting burnt out from this constant struggle to understand how to do simple tasks in a country where you don't speak the language? And yes, <laughs> we do. Uh, we get burnt out a lot, probably especially if it's in a new country that we've never been to. Yeah, so I think for me, a lot of those are things like anything from grocery shopping where you're trying to you know, read a language and try to understand uh, what the ingredients are or even what, you know, if this is regular yogurt, is this Greek yogurt? Um, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to literally read it because the type is so tiny and I'm like over 40. So, you know, I don't have my glasses with me. Um, but also even just finding, finding stuff in these different grocery stores. A lot of times they're markets. So like right now we're in Albania and Albania, you find like all these tiny little markets everywhere. And so it's like just jam packed full of stuff. And so you have to like, it can get very overwhelming trying to find what you're looking for. And then sometimes you struggle to just ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, but we find that most of the times there's always somebody that can speak English. Um, and if not, then they'll, you just keep asking the next person. And you know, the, the, usually they're very helpful to try to help you. Um, and then, or, you know, we of course used Google Translate, which is our best friend. And that can be, be very helpful. Yeah, that helps out a lot. But yeah, it, it can get kind of overwhelming a little bit. Yeah, um, probably like sometimes local transportation is another yeah. one that can be a little bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some countries it's very clear, it's easy to, to find everything, like there's a bus stop. Right. But again, like in Albania, <laughs> we're at right now, uh, there's no it's not clear where the bus stop is. Like, so you have to kind of ask around, try to figure out where it's at, or even the ticket office. Um, so that can be a little frustrating, but I think we've learned you just have to, you get used to it the more you do it. And you just have to like be patient and, you know, just ask, just ask. Someone who will usually be able to help you, you know? Yeah, usually seems like it. Okay, so moving in next question. Do you ever get tired, overwhelmed, and just have quiet days in? Yes, we do, um, especially if we're in a place where there's a lot of activity or maybe it's a little bit more chaotic than we're used to um, or even if there's a lot of, there's a big kind of social scene like mm -hmm. here in Albania right now, we have a lot of friends. So we're going out a lot and meeting a lot of people, meeting a lot of new people as mm -hmm. well. Sometimes that gets a little kind of overwhelming, at least for me, I'm a little bit more introverted than, than Joel is. Uh, so, yeah, I I tend to probably like more quiet days in. Yeah, or even we're also working yeah. too. So both, you know, with the YouTube channel and the podcast and, uh, you know, our just website. like our website mm -hmm. um, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and we're also like working on create, we have another project that we're working on as well. So between all of that, you get really burnt out and 
you know, sometimes you just have to notice when you get to that point and just stop and take a day off. And next year, our good friend Paul uh, told us that last year because we were doing like seven days a week, 10 hours a day, and, you know, never felt like we're getting very far. And he's just like, dude, you just gotta like <laughs> take a day off, take some yeah. time for yourself. And so we've been incorporating that. You know, now I think for other people though, if like you're retired or whatever, like a lot of the retirees that we've met, um, maybe don't have as much of that problem. You know, it's more right, of the yeah. it's more like staying busy sometimes if they don't yeah. have a hobby or or something like that. Yeah, this is all based on yeah, just our experience. Right, so, so kind of more like nomad, yeah, working, working, traveling nomads. So mm -hmm, for sure. Right. So what else we got here? Um, let's see here. Oh, okay. So you must be wearing clothing items uh, very frequently. Are there specific clothing items that you spend more money on because they're getting so much wear, or do you replace your clothing pretty much pretty often and buy it inexpensively? Yeah. So this is a really interesting question and something I never really thought about until we started traveling full time. And because before, you know, you'd only wear your clothes maybe once a week, maybe every two weeks you're wearing things. So I had clothes that were lasting me for, you know, 10 years. And now, yes, we go through clothes a lot. <laughs> like I'm, I'm really noticing it because we carry with very small, carry very small suitcases. They're uh, carry on only. Mm -hmm. And so that really limits our, uh, our clothes and what we can pack. So yes, we run, through clothes pretty often. We just had to buy you new jeans before this trip because you wore holes in them. I wore holes in them, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but I always like wear holes in my jeans. Yeah, so, but there are, to address like the, do we spend money on some nicer clothing? We do. I've invested in some really nice shoes that were quite expensive, so I'm hoping that they last me at least, hopefully five years, if not more. So there are certain items that we do. Yeah, that's a good good point. Cause like for me, I've got some like trail running hiking shoes that are super lightweight that again, I spent, I don't know, 120 bucks on. Mm -hmm. um, but those things have been really invaluable um, cause we, we like to do a lot of walking and hiking and things like that. So I think it's a matter of figuring out what works for you and you know, investing in that. Like again, I have another pair of shoes I had last year. I thought they were gonna last me a whole year. And I wore, oh, right. I wore them out in like six months. Yeah. You know, I just, the whole, I had no traction or anything. Yeah. And so we had to replace those. Um, you know, also like shorts, like we have a lot of, since we're in sunnier places a lot, I, you'd be surprised like how much sun damage your clothes get. And so I had a pair of shorts that also just were so bleached and everything. And a jacket, because mm -hmm. I had to pick up a jacket in, when we were in Portugal, because I just, I didn't have enough, you know, we didn't have enough warm clothes. Um, and so I bought this like 11 euro, like, you know, zippy hoodie thing. And, uh, but yeah, by the time we left Portugal, which is like three months, it was already like sun bleached and everything like that. So. Yeah. Cause you wore it so much. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was wearing it like every day. Yeah. Yeah. So that is something to think about. Mm -hmm. Um, but definitely invest in, I would say your, your pieces that you wear every day try to invest in those and spend a little bit more money mm -hmm. like shoes jackets probably a pair of jeans or pants yeah i mean the other thing is too is you can get clothing you can replace it while you're traveling yeah. and we found actually some pretty good deals especially in europe mm -hmm. um so it really isn't that hard to replace some of those things so you might not have to be spending as much money to do that mm -hmm. um, especially compared to like the united states um so, I mean, that is something to think about as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm curious as to how you handle being together 24-7, 365 days a year. <laughs> Do you ever get on each other's nerves? Do you occasionally take separate time to pursue your individual interests? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes and yes. Um, you want to take the first one? Yeah. So, how do we handle being together 24-7? Uh, it is definitely been a learning curve for us, right? To try mm -hmm. to learn how to be together, travel together and work together. That is very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'd say the working part is what kind of 
makes it extra hard for us. Yeah. So, I mean, there might be a lot of people watching this who won't have to deal with that. Right. They, you know, they're hopefully be, not. <laughs> yeah. They'll be, re, you know, you're going to be retired and, you know, you're just going to be traveling together. Well, you, you'll still be with each other mm -hmm. a lot, but you'll probably have your own interests as well. So maybe you can get out and, you know, get some separation. You know, maybe you go for a walk by yourself or there's a restaurant, you know, that you like to go to yeah. by yourself and just sit at. So, yeah, our situation is a little bit more difficult because we are working as well while mm -hmm. we travel. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'll add to that as far as on my side of it. The other part is that we literally work across from each other. So we're a lot often in the same room. And so we'll literally be like, my computer's here, your computer's here. <laughs> And so you're tempted to just be like, oh, hey, what about this? I got this idea. And then you're interrupting the other person. And that's mm -hmm. like our biggest role. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes and sometimes there's like a co-work or a coffee shop or something like that. And you're like, you'll you'll go there and you know, maybe you'll work from the coffee shop or whatever for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I can't do that as easily because I'm usually doing like editing stuff. So my it's a bigger computer, hard drives. So it's just more inconvenient to do that. Um, now, as far as like... Uh, well, also we have friends, so, you know, you know, like we often go back to places where there's like some kind of a sense of community That's really important to us um, Like whether it be in Bonsko or or like even here in Saranda um, We've got a bunch of friends. So that does make it a lot easier for us where we can mm -hmm. I can just like go and meet some, you know, meet some guys for a beer or just do whatever um, yeah. and then like you might go Go for some ice cream or, or, or whatever you want to do. Or I'll stay in. Or you'll stay in. <laughs> yeah, if I, if get, I don't want to be social, I'll get my quiet time yeah. in. But we do, we have found that we, we actually travel really mm -hmm. well together. It's just kind of the whole like being together constantly and working together. Uh, so, but we do take breaks as well to address that. Like when we were back in the United States last year, I went to see my parents mm -hmm. and my family for an extended break. So I was there for six weeks and Joel stayed in Nashville and worked on some separate projects yeah. of your own yeah. with another business partner. So yes, we did consciously make a decision to have some time apart and, you know, it just, just gives you a little bit of, of space mm -hmm. to kind of, I don't know, well, maybe reconnect with yourself. I absolutely. Guess, you, know? you know, and it's, it's been really good for us. And yeah. We've done that as well in the past too, yeah. um, maybe not for six weeks. It's been usually a little shorter than that. Yeah. Um, but it was great. It was a really good reset for both of us, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, we were still communicating of course all the time because we were kind of working and then of course we're, you know, Hey, how you doing baby? <laughs> but, uh, um, but it was a nice separation and it allowed us to pursue those other, other things. Um, yeah. And then when we got back together, you know, when you came back to Nashville and it was, it was super easy. It was it was really good because then we had that extra. I think it helped us since we had that time. It was you know we weren't like you know getting on each other's nerves as much. Right. And yeah. So that was helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Do you ever get to feeling like you were on an ex exasperated <laughs> long vacation and you just want to get home to rest? Oh, I don't. Know. That's a good question. Hmm. Uh Maybe sometimes I've felt like that, or I think it's more like to go back to the United States, you're like, oh, I know everything there. It just feels easy. You know, I just, I, I just want something easy for today. But sometimes that's, just, that's usually just like kind of a passing thing for me. Okay. You know, I'll get over it and be like, oh no, you know, I, I don't, I really don't want to go back. <laughs> um, so maybe it's just, for me, it's more convenience where I get that kind of feeling, but I don't feel like I'm on any kind of like long vacation though. I think it's because we're working yeah, too. It be. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you're, if you don't have anything to do all day long, then, you know, or you're not good at filling your time, Yeah. you know, on I could going for walks and adventures and stuff right. like that, then I can see how that could be. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, no, I don't, I, I have, I really don't have any issue. <laughs> I don't ever feel like I'm on a long vacation. And again, like you said, maybe part of it's the working part. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, I don't have to go back to the States as much. You know, I'm, you know, I was, I was in the service, so I'm used to like being away from people for a much longer period of time. So that I think it would take a lot longer for me. I haven't hit that yet. I'll just say that. Yeah. So. Okay.
What things do you miss the most from before you started traveling full time? That's a good question. Okay, so for me, <laughs> it's well, okay, like Michelle said, convenience. It's really nice to be able to just be like, oh crap, I need this. Amazon, boom, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Uh, that's super nice. Yeah. But as far as like physical things or like our house or whatever, I don't miss the house. I miss, I, of course, I miss my friends. Um, but outside of that physical possessions, I think it's really, I miss my TV. I miss having like a giant 4k TV where I can just like watch all my shows and everything. <laughs> and probably it's cause I, I come from a film background. So, yeah. um, and then the other thing is I miss my studio. So I used to have like a, I used to have a studio behind our house, um, where I, I used to do like photography in there. And then it was also like kind of my studio when I was producing. So I would do all my editing and all that kind of stuff. And it was like my man cave, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So I had my, you know, everything in there. So it was a place I could go and just get stuff done. I had a giant like whiteboard, which is the other biggest thing I miss is I'm very visual. And so I have to like, I have to see everything, spread things out, see it all. And uh, I miss my whiteboard a lot. <laughs> And I have not found a solution while traveling for a whiteboard, but not yet. Every day I hear about missing the whiteboard. <laughs> if you have a solution for us, let us know. Yes, please leave it in the comments. <laughs> okay, what do we got next? Um, uh, no, I haven't said mine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I would have to say the same thing. I don't really miss our, our house or anything like that. I miss maybe some of my clothes. <laughs> I did. I did have a lot of clothes. Uh, so yeah, sometimes it's kind of nice to have a variety of clothes to pick from, but you know, that's not something, that's not a huge thing for me. I would say the same. I miss our TV where we used to watch our shows, our couch. Yeah. I miss having a comfortable couch. It's so and, weird. <laughs> yeah. Our bed. Our bed. Yeah. I miss having a comfortable bed. Some that's beds, a kind of a big thing for me though. Too. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we get some really great beds and we get places that have like actually decent sized TVs, makes mm -hmm. it easy to like chill. Um, and then other places aren't so much. So yeah, that, that's a, again, having to learn how to be uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not so bad. I mean, you get used to some of those things and then there's yeah. sometimes you have solutions like Sometimes you can find like a comforter or an extra blanket or something like that to, to make the bed a little bit more comfortable or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if you can see it in this video, but there's like a tiny little TV up there. It might be cropped off, but it's like, it's, I don't know, it's not that big. It's like a 24 inch TV or something, maybe. So I do miss my big TV. <laughs> As you get further into your travels, which countries are you looking forward to returning to? Or could you see yourself staying for three or more months? Yes. Uh, well, we've already done this, actually. Mm -hmm. We've already returned to a couple of countries. And that would be, if you've watched or listened to some of our episodes, that would be Bulgaria. We're actually returning there for the third time. Mm -hmm. And that's just because there's such a good community there and a lot of friends that we meet up with uh, every year. So mm -hmm. that's really fun for us. And it's a it's just a great place to kind of to chill. Yeah. Really. It gets us away from the crowds in Europe during the summer. And it's, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's, it's just a beautiful part of Bulgaria to mm -hmm. be in. Uh, Portugal. I think oh, we yeah. could definitely see ourselves spending at least six months there. Oh, easily. For sure. Yeah. We really felt uh, kind of at home there mm -hmm. and it was, it was easy transition for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all, well, we're back in Albania. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I mean, we liked Albania too. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a little, you know, every place has like, like little pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we even did a, a whole episode on pros and cons of, of Saranda. Um, and probably should do another one. Cause I already think of now that we're back, I think of a whole bunch of other yeah. like, good and like kind of things, you know, that balance out. Um, but yes, yeah, so, like. Albania has been really nice too. We, again, community, again, uh, the weather has been great. Um, yeah, those are reasons that I could easily spend more time here as well. We're unfortunately only going to be here for two months, um, but there's still a chance we could come back. And then again, also, mm -hmm. I could easily stay here for six months or longer. You know, yeah, probably. And you can, as if you're an American, yeah. you get a one-year visa on arrival. 
which is pretty sweet. Okay, next up. Okay. How do you decide where to go next? Did you make a list at the start or just plan for the next few months? Okay, so as far as the first part of that, how do you decide where to go next? Um, I mean, a lot of it has to do with, uh, well, weather, really. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am got, I got pretty bad seasonal depression, so... You know, we, we follow the sun. Yeah, we definitely follow the sun. I'm, <laughs> I'm solar powered, is what I like to say. <laughs> Uh, so we try to do that. Uh, that's a big one there. Um, also, just kind of convenience, like you know, cost is an issue. So, you know, if you don't want to be f spending huge amounts of money on flights, then we'll usually try to route based on on that, you know, like on, yeah. you know, how can we get from here to here? Or is it feasible? Or should we, you know, maybe pick a different country, mm -hmm. you know, that's a little easier to get to maybe. So that's, that's another one. Mm -hmm. And then what was the second part of that question? Did you make a list? Oh, yes, we did. Yes. Yeah, we had a pretty, I mean, basically the world is our list. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if we'll ever do all of the countries. No, we yeah. don't. Yeah, we don't count countries. And this, we're not. A, well, we count them. We just don't. Count them, but we're not it's like. It's not in pursuit of. Yeah, of, seeing every every single country <laughs> yeah. in the world. It's just just because we slow travel. So I don't think we would ever get there. Yeah, it would take us like 40 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but there are, yes, we have made a list and there's there's still a lot of places that we that we haven't been to yet. Yeah. Okay, what do we got next here? Um, oh, this is kind of similar. Uh, does weather or temperature or seasons impact your travel plans? Yes. Yes, especially uh, when you take into consideration packing. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, so I think on this trip we have tried to plan everything kind of around just being in moderate temperature yeah. the whole time, really. Because yeah. we're, we're planning on being gone for a year mm -hmm. from our home country. So, yeah, you know, we didn't, it's, it's hard to pack, um, you know, like if you're going to the mountains or where there's snow, that's, we didn't want to kind of deal with that, so. Well, especially since we're carrying, we're trying to be more minimalistic. Yeah. Our, we can't be carry on only, unfortunately, just because of all the camera gear and stuff that I have to take. Um, but we try to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. And since we are, we have like our small little like base carry on rollers that we use. Mm -hmm. um, luckily they do expand. <laughs> Mine's always expanded, <laughs> but um, so that, but it does limit how much you can take. So, I mean, another option with that would be to purchase clothes, Yeah. you know, where do you go and just return them, like buy something at a discount secondhand or whatever, and then mm. we donate it back. Um, or trade it with someone or just give it away as you go. But we try to avoid that. Um, and then it's your, and how the seasons impact it as well. The, I mean, temperature definitely does too. Yeah, for um, sure. I can handle cooler temperatures. This one here <laughs> is always super cold all the time. Yeah. So not a big cold weather person. So we usually stick with, with warmer destinations or more moderate yeah. temperatures. Although we'll be, we'll be pushing the limit this year because we're going to be going, hopefully at the end of the year, if you watched our travel plans uh, episode, um, we'll be going to Southeast Asia. So um, we think we'll be fine because we've got, we lived in Nashville for uh, quite a while. And so the summers there get exceedingly hot, hot and humid. And humid. Yeah. So as uncomfortable as it is, we at least know how to, to anticipate that. So hopefully it won't be too much of a, We'll a, see. A problem. Yeah. You mentioned you keep your car and have it parked at a friend's house. How does insurance work? And then second part of that question is, do you negotiate the insurance based on use or estimated miles driven? So you may take this one. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, obviously in the States, your insurance goes, you can do a, you can garage a car. A lot of, a lot of companies let you do that. Um, but to do that, you generally have to have more than one car, or more than one car or policy with them. And since we just have the one car, uh, we can't do that. So luckily for us, I mean, we honestly we just keep insurance on it. Basically, just liability and uh, comprehensive. Mm -hmm. So in case something falls on it, because our car is in Tennessee and there are tornadoes, so you know we're at least covered. Mm -hmm. But also, luckily, because we are in Tennessee, uh, the insurance rates are actually really, really inexpensive there. So it becomes more affordable for us to actually keep our car parked at a friend's house 
and just keep the insurance on it year round, then it would, if we go back to the States and have to rent a car for uh, even less than a week, like the cost difference is, yeah. is crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's basically what we do. And yeah. that's why it's just cheaper to, to keep the insurance for us. Yeah. You know, now when we were, you know, living in Washington state for, for a little bit there, uh, insurance was quite a bit more. Uh, so that would probably have us figure something else out. You know, we probably have to like relocate the car somewhere or cancel insurance altogether and then just pay the extra bump in when yeah. you re when you restart it, you know, you know, yeah, you're charging you so much more money. Right. So. I was going to say, if you do that though, we found that if you cancel your insurance and then you restart it, at least in the United States, they really charge you a lot more to do that. So yeah. I think that it's probably maybe state dependent. So I would just do your research and see yeah. which state you live in and, and get some quotes. And before we continue, if you're finding this helpful, be sure to go ahead and give us a like if you haven't already and subscribe so you can find more content like this. You can also find more information at our website, wanderinghearts.com, or you can sign up for our newsletter by scanning the QR code for weekly tips about living a more abundant life through silk travel. And also if you're finding this content also extra helpful and you want to support it, you can also buy us a glass of wine too. And stick around to the end because we will be talking a little bit more about another project that we've been working on that I think will help you in your preparation for becoming a nomad if you're not already. Okay, so next we're going to talk, we just have the one question about accommodations, but it's the one that everyone always asks all the time. And for a really good reason, because it's probably the biggest, it's the biggest expense when we travel is accommodations. Uh, so... The question is, what is the best way to book directly with a landlord slash owner in another country? And then they had went on to say that we had mentioned Albania specific or specifically. So what would you like to say? About that? Yeah. So we found the best way is to start researching on Google maps mm -hmm. and then see if they actually have a website for the property. And then, yeah, if they do contact them the management company, or sometimes you can get uh, the, the owner directly and then either call them or email them and see if, you know, what, what they can give you or what they have available. More than likely, it's going to be cheaper than Airbnb. Yeah, because you save the, all those service fees and right. stuff. Yeah, so that's kind of where we start first. And then next is uh, we ask friends if they've been to, uh, you know, places that, that we haven't been to. Uh, we ask them for recommendations. If they can send, you know, if they have a landlord that they really liked, we usually ask them to, you know, pass it on. Like we're doing that right now, trying to find a place in Romania. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge help. Uh, also Facebook groups, I yeah. would say, uh, getting connected um, to Facebook groups for specific destinations or cities, you can usually find like a nomad yeah. group mm -hmm. or even expat groups as well. Yeah. Some even have very specific like housing, like short term housing uh, yep. groups as well. So I know yeah. like Bonsco has got one of those Do you like, I think it's like a Bonsco's owners, owners and rent or something like that. Yeah. Um, so you can definitely find places like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then what in some countries, uh, some countries you can, there are a couple platforms that you can still use that work directly with the owners um, mm -hmm. and don't charge as much fees. And I think like in Europe, one that we like to use a lot is Flat.io. Um, I know it's not a direct owner thing, but we found, some, found it's a lot easier because mm -hmm. usually they're working with management companies too. So it's kind of like that. Right. And then what a third, I guess the last option I would say would be um, just boots on the ground and just like walking around and you know, looking for yeah. l learning what the words are for, for, you know, for lease or for let or for rent and, yeah. and just, you know, knocking on doors and calling those numbers, you know, and maybe you stay somewhere for like a week, like at an Airbnb or something like that for a week or a hotel, mm -hmm. and then give yourself a chance to do that and then ask around. Um, it's a little bit more risky. So maybe the more adventurous can do that. <laughs> yeah. We, we don't tend to do that. We generally don't tend to do that. 
but it's an option. And then finally, I guess, real estate agents too. So a lot of other countries, um, the real estate agents will also help you find like rent, especially if you're going to be doing a little bit longer term, like over th like six months or something like that, or a year. Mm -hmm. uh, those can often give you like some, some guidance in that regard. Yeah. It, it does take a lot of research though, I will say, and it yeah. takes up a lot of our time. It's probably one thing that takes up it's our least favorite thing to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a huge amount of our time in travel planning. I mean, and part of that too is because we have a specific budget that we're trying to hit. If you don't have the, if the budget's not an issue, then obviously it's super easy. Yeah. But um, when you're trying to keep under, like keep on that, your budget, then that's where it adds. You know, basically, you're trading time for, for money in that regard. Yeah. And speaking of budgeting. Yeah. So that moves us. Yeah. That moves us into our questions that we get about budgeting. So our first one is how do you budget for travel? Uh, what are your monthly budget expenses and how do you divide that up? Uh, so yes, we do have a monthly budget. Mm -hmm. And if you've watched some of our cost of living videos, you'll know that we do try to stick to about uh, $2,000 mm -hmm. a month. And that's for both of us. Yeah. Uh, so but our budget can change depending obviously on our destination. Sometimes it'll be a little bit higher, like for a you know, costlier place, like if we have to go back to the United States or if we're in maybe in Western Europe where things are a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. So we kind of you know move our budget up and down. Yeah, it kind basically. of balances out. Yeah. So you stay in a we'll stay in a more inexpensive country. Um, you know, maybe for a couple months mm -hmm. and then that helps us kind of like balance out maybe a month in a more expensive country. Yeah. Um, and it also helps us kind of cover some of those transportation costs as well. Uh, cause we generally, that $2,000 is not usually covering long distance transportation. That'll usually be right. like local or just short distance transportation. So that is one way that we use to kind of, kind of balance that out and to hit, to hit our budget, you know? Yeah. And then dividing it. I'm not sure what that means, um, unless it's just talking about monthly. I'm not really sure. So I think that answers that question. So our next question, has your bank asked why you have a lot of charges in withdrawals from your travel locations? Um, this person is curious if our bank or credit card company has ever reached out to us to find out why you've had these charges abroad over our past four years of travel. No, no, I don't, not that we've ever known, <laughs> I don't think, but that's because we, we always have a list of things that we have to do before we leave mm -hmm. our home country. So yeah, we always make sure that we give travel notices to our banks and our credit cards. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, it's super easy to do. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times if you got, you can just log in online and there's a, a section where you can actually put a travel notice in mm -hmm. and you just have to list like when you're starting to travel or what your range is. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, just list the countries you're going to be in and, or you can call them, you know, and you just tell them and they're like, okay. And then that way they're not going to flag anything right. accidentally. Cause we have had that happen, but this was years ago, like on our honeymoon actually. Oh yeah. We had our... That's right. Yeah, a honeymoon it happened, but that was like 15 years ago. Yeah. You couldn't just go online and do that. Then. Right. And that's when we learned to do that. Um, and then with our credit card, uh, our credit card is a travel credit card. And so like you can literally read it on the website. They tell you there's no need to contact us because they already expect it. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a Chase Sapphire Preferred. Um, it's a really good card. If, if, if you don't have one, we've got a link. You know, you can do that if you want. Um, but it's, it also is great about it is that we can set alerts up on it. So that's what we do. We just set alerts for international transactions, domestic mm -hmm. transactions. We can set like dollar amount limits and things like that. Yeah. So, uh, which actually kind of makes it easy too, because we set a pretty low limit mm -hmm. that way when we, we pay something and it, we, we can already see what the conversion fee is for, for, for paying. Yeah. Which is really nice. So we automatically get an email every time we make a, a purchase so you can see it right away. Yeah. And that looks like that leads in kind of continuing on that. The next question is when you're traveling, do you use a U.S. credit and or debit card? 
And the answer is yes and <laughs> yes. Um, like again, luckily we, we use the Chase Sapphire as our main travel credit card. Um, we have a backup card as well, um, but that's like our main one. And amazingly, because we get the points and it has a lot of protections already built into it, uh, which is really nice. And then as far as the debit card, uh, so we have a, a T-Mobile money account and it comes with a debit card. You don't have to be a, have to be a T-Mobile member to get it. And that's what we used the last three years, yeah. almost four years actually. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty good. We didn't ever have to worry about uh, getting charged from T-Mobile on that side of it for ATM fees. Um, however, you know, you may still be charged on the bank side, the local side for ATM fees. Uh, but we've since uh, gotten a, uh, a Charles Schwab account and we'd highly recommend that. Um, Schwab's great because they also, when you have the debit, you, you basically set up a brokerage account and then you can add a cash account with it that has a debit card. Mm -hmm. And that's been really good because they actually cover some, I think to a certain limit, but they do cover quite a bit of those local transaction fees that you'll get at the local bank. Um, in addition to that, they don't charge you any transaction fees on their side either. And they've got very competitive conversion rates. So that's good and make sure. So two more things on that. One is uh, make sure that if you are traveling to check the expiration date of your card <laughs> and make sure it's not expiring okay. while you're on your trip. Cause that happened to us last year and we had to have our new debit card sent to us uh, to Bulgaria and it took one month. It took us a month to get them and it cost like $40 and it was just ridiculous. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just cause we just, I don't know how we missed it, but we just didn't check our, our cards. Yeah. Just so, something that we didn't even think about and they expired while we were traveling. So, so that's on our pre checklist now yeah. that we do. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, and then what was the second thing I was going to say about that? Um, well, I was just going to say, we don't use our debit cards for anything mm -hmm. but ATMs. Yeah. We don't ever purchase anything online with them and we don't use them for any international transactions. Yeah, I just don't want, it's just too risky for yeah. us um, to have that happen. You know, we don't want our, and there's holes, right? A lot of times they'll put a hold in your card and right. sometimes you might lose access to some of that cash, even yep. if it's temporary. So, yeah. yeah. We always use our credit card. So just make sure though that you do pay it off every month. Oh, yeah, definitely. So yeah, no financial advice, but um, yeah, we, we don't carry a balance on anything. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not able to do that, then don't get a credit card. All right, what do we got next? Food. Food. Okay, this is one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> yeah. And yours too. Uh, this is my, one of my favorite <laughs> subjects, but it's not uh, my favorite thing to do, which is buying groceries. Oh, yeah. So this question is, we yeah, we get a lot about about buying groceries. So buying your groceries for a long stay, how do you find that you, or do you find that you buy for a week at a time? And then do you, to start, do you buy the same or very similar items? So yes, we do try to buy for a week at a time. This all depends though on how big our, our refrigerator yes. we have in our apartment. Sometimes we have very small refrigerators so we can only fit so much in. Yeah. So we're having to go to the grocery store, I don't know, probably every three, three or four days. Two or three days, depending on, yeah, if it's a small refrigerator. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, do we buy very similar items? Yes. Yeah. We kind of have a list. Yeah, you get your basics. You know, yeah. everyone has their certain, you have your, your taste, whatever you like. Um, and so, yeah, we have our list of stuff that we start with. You know, there's always some kind of like chicken and cheese and... Um, Pasta, pasta, pasta sauce, uh, like a, some kind of like a sausage or something, um, which especially in the Balkans is really easy to find sausages and it's usually really good. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, veggies. We love the vegetables in like Europe, uh, we are just absolutely delicious. Our fruits. Um, yeah, fruits as well. And they're usually really inexpensive. So, uh, yeah, we do like, we have a couple recipes that we kind of do. Those are our staples. Yeah. You know, like a Shopska salad, which is kind of like a like a Greek salad, but mm -hmm. without the olives. 
Yeah. And the local feta cheese. Anyway, so I won't get. <laughs> I'm going to get into all that. But, <laughs> but going um, back though, uh, so yogurt, granola bars, coffee, chips, and then snacks like peanuts and pretzels. Yeah, or or something equivalent. Bar. Like if it's not a granola yeah. bar, then granola. Yeah. Um, like that kind of thing. Um, but you know, off, there's also a lot of stuff you can get locally. And we always like to try some of the local foods as well um, to see if, you know, any of those things, you know, we always like try to experiment, you know, and sometimes we'll just like pick up that stuff too. Mm -hmm. Next up, we're going to answer your questions about communication. So the first one is, did you guys keep paying a monthly fee to a U.S. carrier so you can keep your U.S. phone number? Okay. That's actually yeah, a really good question. Mm -hmm. So for our first four years of travel, we did. We had a T-Mobile plan. It was, I think it was like the Magenta Plus plan. Um, and that was expensive. <laughs> so uh, if you watched any, again, some of our cost of living videos, uh, you will hear us talk about that. Um, but this year we did something different for this trip. We actually decided to cut costs and we're, we ported all of our phones over to Google Voice. And so it's essentially a voice over IP. And yes, yeah, so that's what we're using now. And then basically what we use is rely on Wi-Fi when we're out and about or even in our apartment and also uh, eSIMs to do use for all of our data and everything too. So uh, we will probably do, we'll talk a little bit more about this in another episode because there's a lot of, a lot of details about it, you yeah. know, to kind of like show yeah. you how to do it, what are the costs associated with it. Um, cause it is a, and when to do it. Cause you definitely want to do it at least a month before you plan on traveling. Um, so yeah, there's those things. And then also, like I said about the eSIMs, we are, that's something new for us as well. And of course you have to have a phone, like a newer phone will do that. Last couple of years, I think we'll all have like eSIM capability. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've been testing that out and so far it's been really good. Um, for most of the ones we've been doing, we had one so far that's been a little Hasn't worked out. That wasn't the worked, best. That worked out the best, but yeah. um, we'll be doing further kind of like reviews on that as well on the channel, and uh, just kind of show you like what's worked best for us, especially in the different countries that we're going to. Um, so, yeah, that's basically going to help us save a lot of money this year. So, but we didn't want to do a full thing on it yet until we've had a few months of usage, you know, so that we don't have to make a. A video after that going uh whoops you know <laughs> right <laughs> hopefully that's not going to happen yeah but uh, so far so good next up is how to keep your u.s cell phone when you spend most of your time abroad so, so kind of the same thing yeah we yeah like i said we ported our phones over mm -hmm. to google voice so that means we still have our u.s cell phone number um when you do it you can also google voice will give you a u.s number as well um and i think this is mostly just for if you're u.s citizens i don't know that you can get it how easy it is to get one from another country so um but yeah so we do that and that helps us we're able to make calls back to the states uh basically across wi-fi or through data and you can also receive calls which is really nice too uh, from the states and as far as international calls you got a couple options you can always get a local sim card like an actual physical sim card and those often have of course they have minutes and some data involved and then you physically put in your phone or also you can use some of the eSIMs will do that as well. You can either get an eSIM that a few eSIMs have data included, um, or you again just use some other communication thing like WhatsApp. Uh, you can use Facebook Messenger, Skype. There's a bunch of different systems that you can use. Yeah, I would say WhatsApp is though probably one of the best apps that we for communication, especially in Europe, because a yeah. lot of businesses will have a WhatsApp number. Mm -hmm. So you can literally just call in. And that's actually how we keep in contact with our family too. We just mm -hmm. WhatsApp them, either a video call or yeah. an actual, well, mostly the video calls now. We used to do that for like a regular calls back too, but mm -hmm. but now we can just, I can just call and text my, my, my mom or my dad or whoever, you know, just with their Google voice plan on our regular phones, yeah. which is pretty nice. Yeah. And they also have international calling too. So I think the Google thing has it. They charge you should get charged for minutes, but it's pretty reasonably priced. It's less than we were paying before, mm -hmm. and it kind of varies by country. But you can look all that stuff up to see 
And you just have to basically just put a little bit of money into that account ahead of time. And once it gets low, you can set it to refill or just add some more. So next. Oh, this is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is this is a big one, especially for people in the United States. So this is addressing healthcare. So how do you guys go about healthcare? And what do you have? Uh, oh, what do you have when you if you have to go to the hospital? Um, yeah, so so back in the States, um, I'm, I'm a US veteran. So I have the VA I rely on. Luckily, I'm in pretty good health. So I'd mostly it's just like checkups and things. I, of course, I've had some other issues that I've been able to take care of. Um, so that's easy for me. And then you have, yeah, I have a plan to the ACA. So, you know, it's, it's pretty reasonable. So I just keep it all year round. Um, and you kind of have to have health insurance if you're a United States citizen or else it gets very, very costly. So that's what we do for the United States. Right. And then as far as healthcare, while we're traveling, uh, we have a nomad travel insurance through safety wing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've been doing that for the last two years. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. you can do like a short term one, or you can do like a long term, or basically month to month. Mm -hmm. And it's good for up to like three hundred and sixty days or something mm -hmm. like that. And then you have to start a new contract. Yeah, if you're going to go for that long. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what we've been using as well. Luckily, we haven't had to use any have any incidences where we've had to make a claim. Right. Um. So I can't speak to that part of it. Uh, but. Uh, we did have one instance where we could have made a claim, <laughs> uh, but we didn't because we were. It was like we had gotten like COVID really bad, and we're so out of it that we couldn't even think straight. Um, otherwise, we if we had simply just gone to the doctor and had them do the official PCR test, then we would have been able to make that claim. And at the time, I, I think it's I don't know if it's still on there or not, but it would have been fifty dollars per policy. So that'd be for one for me, one for her mm -hmm. uh, per day uh, during that time. So since we didn't do that, we ended up losing out on quite a bit of, we're out of pocket for all that. Um, right. So, but we like, we had like the little PCR tests that we brought with us. Um, so that's how we knew we had COVID and ugh, it's awful. But um, yeah, so that's really the only opportunity we could have had so far. And hopefully we won't ever have to do that. Um, but also a lot of the countries that we were traveling in have like, you know, decent or, or inexpensive or free healthcare as well. So, uh, you know, that is an option too. If you just like, you know, broken arm or something like that, you can go in there and if they do charge you, you know, we do have the safety wing. I think it's about a $200 deductible or mm -hmm. well for us, for, for Americans, it's for 200. Americans, yeah. And I think if you're outside the U S or outside of North America, rather, I think it is a zero deductible now. So it is an option too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this moves us into how are you able to get long-term medications mm -hmm. wherever you are? So for me, I do have a couple of medications I'm on and what I usually try to do is get as much as I can before I leave, which is usually like a three month supply. Um, I look up everything before I go to see in all the countries we're going, to try to get an idea of what the availability is, whether it's through doctor or pharmacy. Sometimes I can find the information. Sometimes it's a lot harder. Um, but so far in all of our travels, I've been able to get all the medications that I need um, just from the pharmacies. Yeah. So I was going to say, we haven't, you really haven't had too much trouble. No. And if there is one, a lot of times you can go to a doctor mm -hmm. and they might require a doctor's permission. So you might have to just go to the doctor mm -hmm. and show them your prescription. And then they might do a, a quick exam or something like that. And then they can write you a prescription in that country. Um, I know in Bulgaria, at least, um, like in the little town that we like to stay in, I think it's like maybe 20 leva to see the doctor or maybe it's 20 or 40 leva. So like somewhere between 10 and $20 US um, to see the doctor if you need to get like a local prescription. Um, I don't know about other countries, but we do know, we've talked to a lot of other nomads that we've met along the way, and that's kind of what they do as well. Sometimes if they're not from a, a European country with a, you know, like an EU health card or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have found too that prescriptions or medication here are in the countries mm -hmm. that we've been traveling to in Europe are very reasonable as well. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, so we I just, just pay cash. For right. Them. Yeah, and then I, I mean, I literally had a massive like cold sinus infection that oh, ended yeah. here just like when we as soon as we like when we left the beginning of this trip, and it was so bad. I like blew my nose so hard. I ended up. I think I got like some of that sinus and snot or something like that. Like got into my eye. Like it's gross. Sorry, I should have put like a spoiler or a, a warning, but. <laughs> Well, you got pink eye. It basically gave myself pink eye. And then I, of course, spread it to my other eye because I'm like, oh, you know. And so it was awful. It was five, six, what, six days. And it was just, I couldn't, it was so awful. But the good news is I was able to, I kind of self-diagnosed a little bit. Um, and then I went down to the pharmacy here in Saranda and I was actually able to get a, um, like a name brand antibiotic eye ointment for 200 uh lek. 200 lek so it was like two dollars and ten cents and that cleared me up in you know, like like five days you know just putting that in like I, so i'm all good now uh, but when you looked that up back in the states and the name brand was how much it's like 278 dollars yeah yeah so i mean you can find a generic for like ten dollars in the united states but it's still quite a bit of a, you know, even yeah. just the $10 and $2, that's, yeah. that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, so there's that option as well. So I think that's the end of all of our questions for now. Mm -hmm. If we haven't answered uh, some of your, your questions or there's other things that you are very curious about full-time travel, I'll leave them in the comments below. Mm -hmm. We're happy to try and answer them in another, another episode for you guys. Yeah, and speaking of that, like I said at the beginning, we will have more episodes that are more like really specific to the topics. Mm -hmm. uh, like, like we'll do one on Albania, we've got one on Bulgaria. Um, so you can look forward to those. And then the other thing that we were going to talk about was that little project that we've been working on, and that's called Nomadic Abundance. It's the same name as our podcast that you might be listening to or as well. You can go to the website nomadicabundance.com and you can sign up to be notified when that launches. And it's essentially gonna be, uh, we're putting together guides and some eBooks and things like that to help you uh, in your process of becoming nomadic or whether you wanna be a slow traveler or you wanna be full-time travel, uh, we'll have some guides and things like that to help you get to that point. Um, basically from our four years of experience so far. And uh, also we'll have some additional bonus episodes um, of, of our podcast that you can find there where we go into more details about maybe costs and uh, you know specifics there and also some extended episodes of the podcast too so thank you guys so much for watching be sure to like and subscribe and happy wondering happy wondering